Radio. It is Wednesday, August 3rd, 2011. My name is Sam Cedar on loan from the Majority Report. This is the Young Turks. Jenk will be back tomorrow. As far as I know, I'll be joining Anna in the uh, second hour. Uh, well, folks, happy days are here again, right? The, the jobs should be pouring down from the sky. The economy should be booming because we finally managed to pay off those economic terrorists in the House uh, they've got their debt deal. Now we're on to round two. You thought this was over? Wrong. We're on to round two now, which is where we start to assemble the uh, super Congress. It's better than the old Congress. This Congress has more power. It can uh, completely, completely rip off uh, middle class Americans, uh, workers in this country, uh, basically everybody but the top 10% earners in this country, and they can do it uh, much easier than if we actually had the standard rules for legislation. The White House now, uh, this coming out today in Politico, the White House National Economic Council Director, Gene Sperling, uh, had a meeting yesterday with liberal groups who were, uh, uh, in, in my estimation, uh, perfectly justified in being pissed off about this debt deal. And uh, what does Gene Sperling say to these liberal groups? Hey, tell me if you've heard, you've heard this one before. He pointed his finger back at liberal groups, which he said hadn't done enough to highlight what he saw as the positive side of the debt package. What is the positive side of the debt package? I suppose the, the positive side of it is, is that uh, we now know uh, that we're going to be sold out by the administration uh, when it comes to stimulating this economy and creating jobs. They've pivoted now to talking about jobs, but the fact of the matter is that this debt deal, the idea of cutting at a time of, of recession, at a time where the, uh, the private sector is not creating jobs, uh, this idea of cutting in any shape or form uh, is going to tank the economy. And if it's not gonna just tank the economy, what we're also gonna see is we're gonna see uh, the House and the Senate and the president sign off on, on essentially ripping all of us off from our uh, promised retirement. Let's go to uh, first, well, stock market. Since the days of the, uh, the debt deal sealed yesterday, the stock market plummeted. Yesterday, it, uh, it plummeted on growing worries about the ailing U.S. economy. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped 266 points or more than 2% yesterday. In addition, some investors are now beginning to fret that the debt ceiling could actually further weaken the economy by cutting government spending before the economy has fully recovered from the recession. Of course they believe that because every mainstream economist in the entire world knows that if you cut government spending, you're going to contract the economy at a time when the private sector is not creating jobs and not creating any type of growth in the economy. And what raises it today? It's simply the fact that uh, the Fed announces today as a stopgap measure to basically backstop the, uh, the Wall Street that they're going to consider uh, QE3. What is QE3? Quantitative easing. It's uh, their attempt essentially to shore up the economy by, by injecting uh, cash. This is a good thing. We need cash. The idea that uh, somehow this is gonna create hyperinflation, this is what we're told. By, uh, by the right wing in this country. Uh, this is what we're told by the scaremongers. QE2, when uh, the Treasury, excuse me, when the Fed basically bought our own Treasury bills to maintain that market, essentially injecting cash into the economy, we were told by every right wing nut job out there that we are just days away from hyperinflation. And yet our inflation remains low, except for uh, two things. That would be oil prices and food. This is not calculated into the basic inflation rate or what they call core inflation, basically because uh, things like uh, global warming affect food prices. When you uh, have massive droughts in the Midwest, when you have uh, fires in Russia, the prices of wheat and all other goods go up. The other thing that adds to food uh, inflation, that is transportation costs. Uh, oil is of course um, uh, still higher than we've uh, been paying in years. So we've got stocks falling because of this debt deal, only to be backstopped by the Fed. So stocks are basically a par uh, as of the end of today. But these austerity measures, 
are necessary to improve our long-term fiscal health. This is from a uh, Paul Touchstone, an investment strategist for Stone and Young. I, I would imagine no big uh, lefty. But in the near term, those measures will act as a headwind against growth. In other words, uh, welcome to the double dip recession. And so what we're going to see uh, over the, uh, the, the coming months, first we've got this uh, first whammy of $917 billion uh, uh, cut over the next decade, essentially capping the, uh, the U.S. budget. $570 billion of that is going to come from non-defense discretionary spending. What is discretionary spending? It is just about everything the government does, everything the government pays for that doesn't involve old people. Education and job training, air traffic control, health research, border security, physical infrastructure, environmental and consumer protection, child care, nutrition, law enforcement, healthy skies, healthy water, healthy meat. Enjoy that E. coli uh, Satan sandwich that you're going to be eating. This is going to have, have the amount uh, that the U.S. government spends on, the, on just about all of their functions, short of Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and Defense, have it as a measure against GDP. This is going to go to the lowest amount. In fact, President Obama bragged that this is going to be the lowest level of annual domestic spending since Dwight Eisenhower was president. When Dwight Eisenhower was president, there was no EPA, there was no Clean Water Act, there was no Clean Air Act, there was virtually none of the things that we look to in, a, uh, in, in an evolved uh, society that protects consumers and workers and our children and the air that we breathe and the food that we eat. Uh, it is going to cut investments in new uh, energy technologies, wind, solar. Uh, it's going to... Um, it's, and then we're doing this all, incidentally, at the time where we're giving $30 billion a year away to oil companies uh, so that they can make a profit, even though their profits are at near records again. Exxon was something like 77%. Their profits were up over 77%. I think it was Shell, 44%. This is also going to cut the Worker Investment Act, uh, which funds job training for young people, uh, adults who have lost their jobs. It's going to affect the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program. This is uh, for all those wonderful trade deals which send our jobs overseas. Uh, this program is supposed to be a stopgap and retrain our workers so that they can uh, theoretically compete. I don't know exactly what they'd be retraining it for. I guess flipping burgers and uh, asking uh, what, uh, what size drink you want at McDonald's. Uh, all of this in this debt deal, we're supposed to swallow whole and enjoy it over a, a hostage-taking situation that has been, uh, that, that is uh, precedent-setting. And we know that uh, at least one congressman has reported that Joe Biden had made it clear that President Obama was willing to use his authority under the 14th Amendment. In fact, it's not even authority. He would have been compelled under the 14th Amendment to raise and to continue to borrow money because the U.S. constitutionally cannot default on its debt. So the White House is now blaming liberals for not singing the praises of this debt deal. And I, I guess presumably uh, that's why uh, the, the stock market uh, tanked yesterday before the Fed stepped in uh, is because they, they watch uh, the Young Turks or, or they listen to my radio program, or they listen to any other liberal talkers, they watch uh, Current or whatever it is, and uh, Wall Street said, oh, well, this must be bad for the economy. Highly, highly unlikely. The Economic Policy Institute, a nonpartisan think tank, not a liberal group, estimates that this deal will raise the nation's debt limit, which will end up costing the economy 1.8 million jobs by 2012. 1.8 million jobs. You've got even people, the head of PIMCO, which is a massive uh, bond trading outfit, is talking about how uh, this, is, th this is just unbelievable that the government is not spending more money. And these are the guys who should be, uh, who are theoretically the ones that we're worried about with our debt, right? The idea is that somehow if we have too big of a debt, people are going to refuse to loan the U.S. money because they're going to be af afraid of a default. Well, of course, we have our treasury bills are at the near all-time lows in interest rates because it's such a secure investment. And uh, that trend continues. 
So meanwhile, we think that this, uh, this uh, super committee uh, is, uh, is, a, is going to save the day. You all know the, the details of the, uh, of the super Congress. There's an automatic trigger if this 12-person uh, 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 bipartisan committee doesn't come up with $1.2 uh, trillion in deficit reduction. If they don't come up with some formula for doing this, the, uh, there's an automatic trigger that's pulled, and at least $500 billion of defense spending will happen, 2% uh, uh, cuts in Medicare provider cuts, which essentially could either work as we're going to pay doctors less, which is going to mean that there's going to be less access for people on Medicare, or possibly, I guess, they would bargain with uh, pharmaceutical companies. That is highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. And so we're being sold this notion that somehow this is going to rip apart the Republican Party, that somehow the, uh, the neocons and the uh, anti-tax zealots, uh, anti-tea uh, uh, party, anti-tax uh, tea baggers are, are going to uh, are going to be involved in an internal war. Uh, so today, we hear uh, Nancy Pelosi, and uh, do we have sound of Nancy Pelosi? We don't, do we? No. Okay. So Nancy Pelosi uh, came out with a statement. Remember, Nancy Pelosi appoints three Democrats to the committee. Harry Reid appoints three uh, Dem uh, Democrats to the committee. You have uh, Eric Cantor the House uh, Majority Leader, and uh, John uh, Bonaire, I think it's pronounced. Is it Bonaire? I think it's Bonaire. It's, I think it's French-Canadian. It's Bonaire, right? Uh, John Bonaire uh, appoints three uh, committee members. Now, all of those Republicans are going to be against any type of uh, tax increases. And today, Nancy Pelosi vowed, well, this is her statement. I'll just read it. Uh, she was asked whether the people she appoints to the committee will make the same stand that she made during the debt limit fight, that being that Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid are off the table. No cuts. No cuts to these so-called entitlement programs. Uh, entitlement, uh, they're called entitlement programs because Americans have paid into them for almost 70 years, depending on the program there, and uh, they're entitled to this payback. Her response, that is a, pri a, pri a priority for us. But let me say that it's more than a priority. It's a value. It's an ethic for the American people. It's one that all the members of our caucus share so that I know whoever's at the table will be someone who will fight to protect those benefits. Uh, that's a fairly full-throated promise that none of the people she appoints to the committee will cut Social Security or Medicare. Uh, do we have a clip of Harry Reid making a similar promise? Harry Reid sounding like a, a cricket. I guess the answer is no. Uh, and, and I'll tell you why that's important, because Harry Reid is going to put uh, uh, somebody on there. It's only going to take one, because 7-6 will send uh, this legislation, excuse me, 7-5, uh, I guess it would be, will send this legislation to the House and the Senate. This legislation, when it heads to the House, cannot be uh, amended in any way. It gets a clean up or down vote in the, in the Senate. You know, the place where if you have any progressive legislation, it necessarily needs 60 votes because of the automatic filibuster that seems to exist for any type of progressive or liberal legislation. Uh, in the Senate, no filibuster allowed. This is a, it's an up or down vote. And when you start thinking about people like Mark Warner or even Dick Durbin, who's come out and said, it's all right to raise the Social Security age, despite the fact that we're talking about a nine- seven, eight percent cut on benefits, depending on how old you live. Uh, Joe Lieberman today came out today, said, bottom line, we can't protect these entitlements and also have the national defense we need to protect us in a dangerous world. Uh, because you know that uh, Joe Lieberman has jihadists that live under his bed. Uh, they're just waiting, waiting, waiting until that moment uh, that he in any way sticks up. <laughs> there he is, uh, Joe Lieberman, uh, smiling because he knows those jihadists uh, will only come out from underneath his bed um, if he doesn't attempt to cut Social Security in some way. He said, while we're at war with Islamist extremists who attacked us on 9-11 and will be for a long time to come. Now, the fig leaf that we're being sold on this is that there's no way 
the committee is going to end up at 7-5. Seven, uh, seven There's no way this legislation will get out into the, uh, the full House or Senate. And I got news for you, if it does, it's going to pass. Uh, there's no way this super committee is going to pass something and it not be passed in the House and the Senate. It's highly, highly unlikely. And so the fig leaf that we're being sold uh, by the administration, by a lot of uh, establishment uh, so-called liberals, is that, well, we know that the Democrats are going to demand new revenue. And we know that the Republicans are going to refuse to uh, increase taxes in any way. Uh, so this, this, this committee is going to be hopelessly deadlocked. They won't come out with the legislation. The trigger will be pulled. And uh, we should all be uh, celebrating the fact that $500 billion in defense uh, cuts will happen. Yes, I'm happy about that. But when you talk about this 2% cut in Medicare uh, to providers, which is going to end up uh, shrinking the access, and then you talk about the other several hundred billions of dollars cut from entitlements. And we've already talked about it. We're going to be cutting entitlements down to a level that we haven't seen in almost 60 years in this country, at a time where we didn't have an EPA where we didn't protect uh, food in the way that we do today. We didn't protect streams in our air. We didn't provide as much uh, um, job retraining. We didn't have to because unions uh, provided wages for uh, Americans. Uh, despite the fact that we're told that's the happy option, I have uh, one theory of what we're going to see, and I'm not seeing anybody talk about it, Matt Taibbi had a piece a couple of days ago about this, and this has been floating in the ether for some time. This is the so-called tax, foreign tax repatriation legislation. It doesn't have a name yet because it's just a floating proposal. Right now, we have U.S. corporations who are basically hiding trillions of dollars overseas, and they can't repatriate that uh, money without being subject to a 35% corporate tax rate. Now, we know that uh, U.S. corporations uh, find a lot of loopholes to not pay these taxes, but these companies uh, basically want to bring it back into the country without having to do any uh, 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 dancing through hoops, and they want to bring it back at a 5% tax rate. They want a 30% tax discount. This happened once before in 2003 under the Bush administration. They called it the American Jobs Creation Act. The amount of jobs that was created under this bill was absolutely zero. Zero. What happened was all of this, uh, this money, these trillions of dollars, was repatriated. And the money, instead of being used for research and development, instead of being used to hire more people, was used essentially to buy back shares of their stock and drive the, shot, uh, the stock prices up. And they're off paying a, a huge dividend for shareholders and CEOs who get paid in stock options. That's what happened in 2003 and 2004 when they pulled this. And this is something that has bipartisan uh, support. So think about this, right? Democrats want to come out of there and say we have revenue increases. So it's justifiable to cut Social Security. It's justifiable to cut Medicare. It's justifiable to cut Medicaid and crap all over poor people. But we got our revenue increases. Republicans can say we didn't allow for any increase in taxes. In fact, we provided for a one-time tax cut holiday in this tax repatriation deal. So everybody gets what they want. It comes out of that committee. It goes to the House. Uh, the Republicans uh, en masse vote for this. Uh, they pass it there. In the Senate, where you have uh, a slight majority of Democrats, you've got people like Warner. You've got people like Lieberman, not a Democrat. Caucus is with him. He will vote to cut Social Security. Uh, they will all be able to have this fig leaf of we've raised new revenues because we're getting 5% on those trillions of dollars coming back in. But they won't have to uh, sell the idea to the Republicans that they're, cutting, that they're raising taxes. Now, what's problematic with this? Well, yes, new revenues are good. We can spend more on jobs programs. Of course, we won't. We haven't seen a, seen a single jobs program come out of this uh, Republican-controlled House. And what's also problematic with this is this is going to be a message to corporate America. Here's the way that you can avoid paying taxes on those trillions of dollars you make overseas. Just wait. Five or six years, that's a great return on investment. You save 30% in your taxes if you're willing to defer it by six, seven, eight years. And not only will we lose that money 
on the taxes that we should be getting from these corporations that are hiding their money overseas, it's going to encourage these corporations to hide more money overseas because they know they can get a discounted tax rate on it. This is going to be the bomb that they drop sometime in uh, November, right around Thanksgiving. You're going to be enjoying your turkey, and all the while, you're going to get screwed. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. More stories after this. This is the Young Turks. My name's Sam Cedar, filling in from the Majority Report at Majority.fm. Welcome back to the Young Turks, Anna and Sam with you. So Matt Damon is extremely politically active, okay? He usually, uh, first of all, he participated in Obama's campaign. He goes to certain rallies. In fact, uh, one of the protests he went to was the Save Our Schools March. And while in he was, D.C., right? In DC. This past weekend. Mm -hmm. And while he was there, he was interviewed by the press. I, understandably, right? And he actually gave uh, several interviews. And in one of the interviews, he talked about tax breaks, right? And I just want to show you guys this video as an example of how, even though he's a celebrity, you know, his knowledge on politics is not... Oh, he's incredibly intelligent. He is. And I think, his, I, think I, I have a feeling his mother is a teacher, actually. I, I'm not sure about that, but I think I heard that. Oh, really? Yeah, he's a very smart guy. He is smart, and he knows what he's talking about. Now, before I show you guys the video, I just want to know, you have to keep in mind, he's an actor, okay? He's not a political commentator. And his, I think he has a hard time articulating what he's trying to say, but his points are spot on. Right. Okay. Let's watch. Do you think the wealthy, those making two hundred fifty thousand and above, are job creators? Create jobs, like small business. Well, I didn't go start a small business with my tax break, um, and I don't know anybody else who did. You know, no, that, they, everybody's socking their money away. That did not create any. Nobody, nobody went and started a business with their with their. Bush tax guy. That's you know. That, 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 I, I don't know who would who would who would believe something that just defies common sense. Um, so no, that's no. I no. I think I, I I was against I was against those tax cuts. I thought they were ridiculous. So little is asked of the of the upper class anyway. You know. I mean, what percent of them or their kids are fighting in any of these wars? What percent of their day is occupied with the fact that, like, there are men and women in forward positions all over the world risking their lives? I mean, what, you know, if you walk down Fifth Avenue, there's no sense that, there's no sense of shared sacrifice. I thought that was a great answer. It's a great answer. I mean, it's, it's sort of a trick question. I mean, what percentage of anybody who's making any money are job creators? Well, it depends on the people. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not really the issue. The issue is, are people making money with the tax breaks? And he pivoted well on that. And his point about the, um, uh, the military is, is, is actually even uh, sort of more um, uh, damning than I think that he even was, was conscious of. Because, you know, remember um, uh, four or five years ago, there was a real problem with recruiting people. Mm -hmm. A real problem with recruiting people. We don't have those problems anymore. And it's not because we have less military personnel, it's because the economy is in the crapper. And people have gone into the military because they have no other economic choice. And so, you know, that is, that is the, 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 the perfect example in the real definition. We know that poor people go into the military. That uh, people who, who don't have a way to pay for college, people aren't going like, I really want to kill some people. Mm -hmm. I really want to go into the desert and be in 120 degree weather and I want to kill some people. I mean, I'm sure there's some. <laughs> but, but we can see just by the numbers. The economy goes south, people go into the military. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he's absolutely right about that. I mean, and, and, you know, I talked about it in the first hour. When we're in this age of austerity, what do people who make over $250,000, uh, what, what are they giving up? I mean, what, what sacrifice are they making? Someone tell me what sacrifice they are making. They are paying the lowest taxes they have paid in 70 years yeah. by, uh, by any measure, by any measure. What sacrifice are they making? I have to see more poor people. More people, more poor people walk past my eyes. That's very difficult for me. That's the only thing I can imagine the sacrifice they're making. Well, you got to keep in mind, look, they, they need those tax cuts. They need those tax cuts because they have to maintain their quality of life. OK, and if that means is, if that means defunding education, if that means getting rid of social programs that people are dependent on, then so be it. But the problem is they're not even if they were actually spending that money mm -hmm. to maintain their quality of life, that would be good. But 
the wealthy don't make that decision. I mean, study after study shows that when you give somebody a tax break like that, what they do is they take their money and they invest it. Right. And they don't invest it in a, in a corporation. They invest it in a, uh, a mortgage-backed security, or they invest it in the stock market. I mean, that's how we get asset bubbles, because you just have people speculating. They don't create any jobs with this money. Right. They don't spend any of this money that they get as tax breaks. They just they find it as a bonus. Listen, when, you get a, uh, when you're making a million dollars a year, when you're making uh, this type of money, you don't go out and spend this money because you're like, oh, you know, I'm a billionaire, but I, I, and now I can buy that island. No, you either buy that island or you don't. You just use this to just accrue more points, essentially. Exactly. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right about that. And going back to his point, uh, Matt Damon's point about how they don't create jobs, these tax cuts don't create jobs. We gave an example of that just last week when Ford Motor Company, uh, one of the companies in the United States that takes huge tax breaks, right? T they take advantage of the corporate tax loopholes. They're building a $900 million factory in India and employing 5,000 people in India. So yeah, they're creating jobs, just not in the United States. Right. That's right. And you know what? They're not creating jobs because they got that tax break. They're creating jobs because they know that there's uh, increased demand in, uh, in Asia for their vehicles. That's Absolutely. the bottom line. They follow the demand. Now, uh, Matt, De Matt Damon was also interviewed by Reason, which is a libertarian publication, and they asked him about tenure and whether or not it makes sense to have tenured teachers. Let's watch. Acting, you, there, is, there isn't job security, right? There's an incentive to work hard and be a better actor because you want to have a job. So why isn't it like that for teachers? You, so think, you, you think job insecurity is what makes me work hard? Well, you have an incentive to work harder, but if there's I, job I security... Be an actor. It's not an incentive. That's the thing. So you take this MBA-style thinking, right? It's the problem with ed policy right now. There's this intrinsically paternalistic view of problems that are much more complex than that. It's like saying a teacher is going to get lazy when they have tenure. A teacher wants to teach. I mean, why else would you take a shitty salary and really long hours and, and, and do that job unless you really love to do it. And he's right. And in fact, you know, she's talking about, he brought up the tenure. In fact, she's talking about just that it's difficult to fire teachers mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in, in, in elementary schools and in high schools and right. whatnot because uh, unions provide uh, protections. Exactly, yeah. And, uh, you know, there has to be a system where you do have some way of protecting teachers from, from firings that are unreasonable because, you know, the, you have a small institution like that. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have uh, uh, superintendents at schools, sometimes you have principals of schools, I don't like that person, I'm going to fire them. I mean, they're not, uh, they need to have some system. You can fire a teacher under union contracts. You just have to go through some hoops to make sure that the firing is justified. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so this notion that somehow teachers, they're getting away with murder, those guys. Totally. They're making so much money. Oh, my God. It's so, it's. We should tax them. As you know, much as we possibly can. These teachers making, you know, like thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year, $20,000 a Ballin. year. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> You know, uh, I mean, it's it, th theoretically, right, this is the most important job that we have in our society, to teach the future. You know, I mean, because you've got, uh, what's his face on the, on the floor talking about, like, we're going we're gonna to squeeze out our, uh, our entire civilization if we allow for um, birth control. Well, I mean, the idea is the future, right? I mean, these are our, but no, of course not. I mean. It's all disingenuous. Yes, they're attacking. Look, what's happening with the so-called school reform movement is they're attacking schools, they're attacking unions, because at the heart of it, if you go into the ALEC, you know, the, um, the mm -hmm. American Legislative Executive Council that is developing all this right-wing um, uh, uh, law, uh, basically between Republican legislators and corporations, uh, they spell it out right there. They don't want to spend money essentially um, educating the, the chief of society. Of course. They want to basically take their money, they want to basically go into their private schools and sequester it, and they don't want to have to deal with the other parts of society. Fundamentally, the question is, do you believe a good education system educates as many kids as possible to the best level that we can do, mm -hmm. versus the way we measure it is we take what our top student gets, and that's the way we measure it. And if that means that the rest of them are completely lost for generations, it doesn't matter. And that's the same way that we measure, you know, uh, our, our, all our processes in this country. You know, is it, do we have a good economy if there is uh, one uh, billionaire and uh, nine, uh, you know, 
people who make one dollar uh, a year, or, or do we have a good economy if everybody makes a uh, hundred million dollars in mm -hmm. that ten people? I mean, that that's the fundamental difference. And uh, from a, you know a, a left perspective, we have a good economy if more people. Maybe are not as making as much as one person, but if more people are making more money uh, and, and, and making as much as they can. Absolutely. And, you know, going back to your point about, um, you know, the wealthy wanting to privatize education or wanting to focus on their kids uh, in terms of making them successful, it's completely true. I mean, you see Republicans that are trying to privatize all schools, right? They don't care about the public school system at all. And one of the reasons why is because it's a great way to keep those from poor communities down. Right. And help the elites continue being to continue being wealthy and powerful, and it, it benefits the corporate society, doesn't it? Right, and uh, it benefits the corporate society. But I think at the end of the day, the the, the real motivation there uh, for a lot of these people is just like I don't want to have to pay for them. Right. Like I don't care. I don't think there is a sense of like I want to keep these people stupid. I think that's just sort of a happy byproduct for a lot of these people. I but think then the bottom you're, line then is you're un-American. Right. Well, no, you're just you're just anti-human being. Right. And uh, you know this this corporate reform movement uses these corporate things. When you go into a corporation, the bottom line is give me a number. I want a number. What was the number you did last quarter? I want to compare it to the number this quarter. If the number's higher, you're better off. You cannot measure education that way because the fundamentals of education are you look at each kid, you see what their their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and you address that. And this this whole corporate reform uh, movement of schools is it's fundamentally against that. And and it's winning because they have the money, and from an educator standpoint, it's very hard to come up with a bumper slogan for a uh, bumper sticker for. We need to actually look at the strengths and weaknesses of each kid and address those uh, to, to properly educate them. I mean, that is the problem, is that uh, good education is nuanced. And mm -hmm. there are ways of dealing with it, but to, to make it all rest on this, uh, you know, testing to uh, um, uh, uh, make it all uh, basic about teaching to a test, that's not a way to educate kids, and it doesn't work. It actually hinders curiosity significantly because when students are in school, they're not taught to be curious. They're not taught to, you know, inquire about certain things, right? They're they're taught to learn about a test, learn how to pass a test, right. and just memorize useless facts to make sure that you get to the next level. Yeah, they so, just they just learn how to game the test. Totally. So, so they're not a, even learning any facts. I they're mean, they're not. just they're just all they're doing is learning how to game this test. Exactly. And that's it. You can do that to a monkey, actually. You can, and it's it's really depressing. And I think it's one of the reasons why, and there was a great alternate piece written about this, it's one of the reasons why a lot of students and a lot of youth in the United States are complacent, right? And, and they don't fight. They're not politically active. It's because they go through 12 years of schooling, and throughout those 12 years, they're taught to memorize facts, but they're not taught to really go out there, or they're not motivated to go out there and quench their curiosity. Right. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. I also, I mean, I read that piece. It's actually a great piece. It is. It is. I mean, I think the the big the the the, the fundamental reason why we're not in the streets is because there's a lot more e economic insecurity. You know, if you're in the 1960s and you go out and you get arrested, uh, because the economy was, the middle class was so financially secure, the idea that, you know, I get arrested protesting, I'm still going to have a job. Mm -hmm. uh, that, was, that was in the consciousness of people. And so they, uh, they, they took those uh, type of chances mm -hmm. uh, and those risks. And I think for, to a certain extent, that's why um, the right wing wanted to create a little bit more e economic insecurity, because uh, there's, a, there's a German saying that uh, first comes the food, then comes the morals except for it's in German. And, um, and the, the idea is that, you know, uh, once you're fed, then you can start debating about politics and you start uh, thinking about those questions. And so it's always important to keep the, uh, the people with a little bit of economic insecurity. Absolutely. All right, the story I promised you guys, uh, Warren Jeffs, who is an infamous polygamist uh, who had his church raided in Texas in 2008, uh, he, there has been a tape found where he uh, instructs a 14-year-old, among other underage girls, on how to sexually pleasure him. Okay, so he is mm. facing a trial right now, and, you know, he, the thing that bothers me about this story is, A, what he's doing, right? He's a horrible fundamentalist guy who is using religion as a way to lure young women into his bedroom. It makes me sick to my stomach. But another thing that bothers me about this is he is the kind of guy that holds other polygamists back. And what do I mean by that? Am I a polygamist? No. Okay. I, I, am, am I a monogamist? Yes. But do I have a problem with other people, consenting adults, living a polygamous life? 
Absolutely not. I have no problem with that at all. So there are individuals out there who want to live a polygamous lifestyle, right? And not necessarily want to get married. They just want to, you know, have several wives according to them or several husbands according to them. And then society looks down on them. But not only that, they get prosecuted for being polygamist. For, uh, for just living together. Yes. If you are li if you even if you're not, you, you, first of all, you can't get married to several people. But right. if you live a polygamous lifestyle, that's considered illegal in several states. I didn't know that. And you can be prosecuted for. I mean, this guy's a he's a rapist. He is a rapist. He's, he's a, rapist. a disgusting person, and then he gives other polygamists a horrible name because as soon as you hear polygamist, the media portrays them as this. You see what I'm saying? This guy's not a polygamist. He's a pedophile. Right. That's right. He is a pedophile. And, you know, to a certain extent, there's a dynamic here that, you know, with the, with the fundamentalist uh, perspective on, frankly, uh, women as being uh, subjugated. Like their job is basically to pleasure uh, the men and, 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 and stay in the background and do as the men says. And uh, this guy just needed, uh, you know, basically some kids so that he could actually impose this type of. I mean, he's he's obviously he's he's. He's, he's nuts. He is nuts. I'm going to give you a quick example of what he was caught saying on the tape. Oof. He says, a good wife is trained for her husband and follows the spirit of peace. Um, he also makes good reference to drawing close or being close, which is how the church uh, members refer to sex. So he tells the women, or the little girls, I should say, uh, to draw close, and that means pleasure me. Mm. I mean, this guy is just disgusting. So I'm glad he got caught. I'm glad he got raided. Uh, it's really sad to know that parents are willingly allowing their daughters to enter this type of situation. That's nuts. I know. That's nuts. That's the worst part of the story, in my opinion. Yeah. You are a parent. Don't get brainwashed by this bullshit. All right? Sorry for my language, but seriously, like, this is ridiculous. Uh, you know what? I don't think you're even telling them. If, they're, if, you're, if you're going to give your daughter up, uh, your 14-year-old daughter, to some uh, nut, uh, nutcase who's going to essentially rape them, um, you've got... You're beyond someone saying, like, you shouldn't do that. Yeah, I know. You, you should oh, be prosecuted. Oh, you know what? You're right. I didn't. That is a bad idea. <laughs> All right, we got to take a quick break. When we come back, Kelly Thomas, a schizophrenic homeless man in Fullerton, California, gets beat down by the cops. It's a really depressing story, but an important one to cover. We'll be back with that and more.